1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. Hear now the very word of God, holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible. Give it your full attention as it is read. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. Thus far the reading of his word. Well, congregation, the comfort of God fuels godly desire. If you recall, Paul at the end of chapter 2 demonstrated his brotherly affection to to God's people. And in the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Paul tells us of his brotherly concern for them. He really wanted to know how things were going with them. His desire was to come to them, and that was so strong that he tried to come, but he couldn't. And so they sent Timothy. And then in verses 6 through 10, we saw Paul's comfort, and that comfort resulting from the report that Timothy brought back to Paul after his visit to Thessalonica. And we know from those verses that Timothy's report was positive. The people were doing well by God's grace. They were steadfast in the faith. Persecution had not brought them down. Timothy also told Paul of their remembrance of him. And they longed to see Paul. And we know that Paul longed to see them as well. And so we also saw that Paul fervently prayed for the Thessalonians, night and day. He knew that they were not perfect in their faith, but he prayed for their comfort and holiness. And so here, at the end of chapter 3, Paul shares some of his overarching brotherly desires for the Thessalonians. And as we look at today's text, we see that stemming from Paul being greatly comforted by Timothy's report that he prays that God will allow him and Silas and Timothy to return to Thessalonica. And he also prays that the people will grow in love, that they might be strengthened and found blameless at the second coming of Christ. And so in verses 11 and 12, we really see the matter of Paul's desire. And Paul's desire was twofold. In verse 11, we see that Paul, Timothy, and Silas desired to come and see them again. And in verse 12, their desire was that the people would grow in love. Verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, he said. Paul desired that God would direct their way to Thessalonica. And in this desire, we find Paul's focus on God's work in his people. To direct our way to you, it literally means to guide, to to make straight the way to you. And in this, we learn a few important things. First, when Paul said, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ, when, when he said that, notice the work of the Father and the Son. The Father doesn't confer any blessing to us except through Christ. And Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, has the same divine uh, divinity and power as the Father. Jesus teaches us in John chapter 10, verse 30, that he and the Father are one. And secondly, we know from chapter 2, verse 18 of this epistle that Paul tried to come time and again, but what did he say? He said, Satan hindered him. Paul recognized the necessity and the blessing of God's direction and his provision. Paul clearly in his desire asked that Satan's hindrances be removed. He needed guidance. He needed direction. 
You know, we often try and, and rely on our own navigation in life. We have our thoughts on the best path, on the, the best timing, the best route. However, we are called time and again in Scripture to not rely on ourselves, to not rely on our understanding, or even be presumptuous in thinking that we can find and navigate the right path successfully on our own. Rather, we recognize that we are to seek the Lord. We don't direct our own paths. God does. We find that to be true in, in one place in Proverbs 16, verse 9, where it says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. But notice thirdly, Paul desired that such guidance would come directly from the Father himself, he says, and the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul desired that God would lead them by the hand, so to speak, remove Satan's obstructions, shine light to the path, and make it straight back to the Thessalonians. For keep this in mind, if the Lord clears the way, if the Lord clears the way, no matter how hard he tries, there is nothing Satan can do to change the direction of that course. If the Lord clears the way, no matter how hard he tries, there is nothing Satan can do to change the direction of that course. And indeed, in Acts 20, verses 1 through 4, we find that it was likely that Paul was able to return to Thessalonica during his third missionary journey. The Lord provided. The Lord answered their prayers. But the second part of Paul's desire was that the people would grow in love. And we see that in verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. You know, growth and love is one thing. Specifically, Paul's desire was that God would cause them to grow in love. Love should be a prominent and a noticeable grace in the life of the Christian. So what prominence does love have in your life, beloved? Do you recognize its presence in your heart? When others watch and observe you, will they see it? When they talk with you, when they interact with you, will they notice it? If the growth, if the growth of love in our lives is the Lord's work, how do we understand his work in us? Well, I think it's helpful to look at passages like John 15, verse 4, where Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. My friends, we are united to Christ. We have been saved by him. If we are trusting in him by faith for our full salvation, if we are his children, we are united to Christ. And because we are united to Christ, we have communion and fellowship with him. And because of this, we see the work of the Spirit in the growth of the fruits and graces in our lives that have been given to us. The graces that God has given us, if you remember last week and in sermons previous, what was Paul thankful for that he saw in the Thessalonians? Their faith, hope, and love. But where did they get that faith, hope, and love? It was a gift of God. It was the work of the Spirit. Christ says, unless one is abiding in the vine, they will not bear fruit. Christ is the source. 
He is also our mediator. And Paul prays that the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. Note that. Since Christ is the vine and since he is the source, we need to understand that true godly love isn't present apart from him. Since God is love, we are dependent on him and his work in us to increase in love. Think about it for a moment. Abounding love. Abounding love. Some of us may recognize the need for growth in love, but think that it would be such a far reach for that to happen in your life. Some of you may think that you love pretty well. Yeah, pastor, you know, I, I think I do that okay. Think about my, my time with my friends, my time with my family, maybe even coworkers. I, I'm a nice guy. I'm kind. Some people have even said, man, you're loving. But let's be honest. There is never a time when we can't grow in love. There is never a time, beloved, when we can't grow in love. There is never a time this side of glory when we can rightly say we've arrived in our love to God and others. There is never a time that we can say this. And so it was right, it was good for Paul to pray that for the Thessalonians, that God would work in them to grow them in love. And so Paul's prayer was exactly that. Lord, increase their love and cause it to abound. Not just that it would be there. They recognize God's grace in their lives. They recognize the love that they had. But Lord, cause it to abound. We can agree with such a prayer, can't we? We should be praying, Lord, increase our love and cause it to abound. And so Paul wanted the people to increase in love to one another. Paul knew the commands of Christ. Christ also had much to say about the importance of loving one another, did he not? Jesus said in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And note that we have the example of Christ's love to look at as we seek to love one another. As we pray that he would grow and build up that love in us, we have his example to look at. In the love of Christ, we see his passionate pursuit of us. We see his passionate pursuit of his people. There is, his pursuit is like none other. Nothing can stop him. His love was evidence in the covenant of redemption between the Father and the Son. In Philippians 2, we see uh, Paul speak to the church in Philippi about that, where we see Jesus' willingness to undertake a mission of redemption being sent by the Father. The Holy One pursued the unholy, the sinful. The Son of God set aside his glory. He took on flesh, and he became man. And in Christ, we find a committed, a selfless, and a patient love. In his humanity, he perfectly endured the frailties and the challenges of the flesh. We find a love that is filled with his kindness and grace. He lived a righteous life, a perfectly righteous, obedient life that we can't live fulfilling the law. He was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, 
And Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses, and he was raised for our justification. And indeed, beloved, this is love, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have been saved by grace through faith in Christ and Christ alone. Such great love. So undoubtedly, as Paul prayed that the Thessalonians would grow in that love by God's work in them, he goes on further to express his desire that they also abound in love to all. Grow in your love for one another, he said, but also to all. My friends, this is an outward-facing, a a neighbor-oriented love. Remember that Christ has commanded us to share the love of Christ beyond our spiritual family to all. This is part of our witness in this dark and dying world. Love is going to work its way out as we show forth the love of Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 says this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. But notice here, back in 1 Thessalonians 3, as Paul, what he says when he wraps up verse 12, he says, even as we do to you. Paul knew that Christ is the perfect example of love. However, because Paul and Silas and Timothy's love was strong and vibrant, he commends their love to the Thessalonians as an example for them as well. Note that. Paul has been so specific, so detailed in his explanations in his communication of their affections, of their concern, of their desire for them, of their thankfulness to the Lord for them because of their faith and their love. The people knew the love of Paul. They not only said it, but they experienced it because he showed it to them in many ways. And here he prays that God would grow them in love. But he also says, Remember how we loved you. Remember how we love you presently. They were to look to their example as well. But then in verse 13, we see the goal of Paul's desire. So that he may establish your hearts blameless before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Literally, heart here is referring to our hearts or even our consciences. Paul is saying that an increase in love establishes or strengthens our consciences. It is a mark of grace. It helps us understand that we are in grace. Did we love the people of God before we were a part of the people of God? Did we love the people of God before we were saved by Christ? No. Love strengthens us. It confirms for us God's work in us. Let me say that again. Love strengthens us. It confirms for us God's work in us. And so Paul's goal was that We would be, as we grow in God's grace of love, strengthened and planted more firmly, that their hearts and our hearts and or consciences would be blameless in holiness before God. In other words, growth in love is a demonstration of growth in holiness. Our communion with God, as it grows and flourishes, our love for him will grow, and therefore our love for each other will grow. And therefore, our love for all will grow as well. Think about it. Our worship is connected to our fellowship, which is connected to 
our witness. But Paul prays that the Lord may establish our hearts blameless before, the God, before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. Paul here continues his instruction on the second coming of Christ, and we've seen this even in these three chapters already. We've seen this in several places where Paul is pointing this out, is pointing forward, and indeed Paul is going to come to a place of more fuller discussion about and even answering questions that the Thessalonians had about what is true about Christ and his second coming. In verse 13, Paul teaches us that we need to remember two things that are true about that second coming. First, that God's work of sanctifying us has already begun and will come to glorious completion at the coming of Christ. This is what he's pointing to. Completion or perfection doesn't happen at our death. Our souls will be complete, but we won't have redeemed, incorruptible bodies at our death. The Thessalonian believers were confused about this. Perfection happens at the coming of Christ when our glorified soul is united with our glorified body. But also, Christ will come with all his saints. Notice that's how he ends the verse. But that was important for the Thessalonians to know, and we're going to see why and more fully and richly in chapter 4. The souls of departed saints will come with Christ when he returns. The Thessalonians did have questions about that, but um, as I said, we will look at that again here in the future. So what can we learn from Paul's brotherly desire for the Thessalonian believers? Well, we need to work at and to strive for fellowship. We need fellowship. God, Paul's desire to be with the people shows that he loves them. We need to make effort. Our love is expressed in our desire to be with each other. And it's also very important that we understand the providence and direction of God. And we also must desire that he directs our paths. That should be part of our desire. We know that he does. But we should desire it for his direction is good providence is always good and is always in our best interest is always right but also we need to abound in love we love but we don't love as we ought we tend to love ourselves far more than we love God and each other and indeed Christ first loved us. He has given us the example of himself as the perfection of love. It is only because he has first loved us that we love and can love him. And so we need to grow. We need to grow. We have not arrived. Praise the Lord that he is at work in us to increase our love. And as we grow in our love of Christ, we will grow in our love for the brethren. We will grow in our love for one another and even for all. But finally, we need to learn to wait. To wait as those who are eager and hopeful, to wait with a focus on living in holiness now living righteously before the Lord, knowing that we aren't perfect now and we won't be perfect until Christ comes again, but looking for that day, having the great hope that Christ has given us for that day. And this is a comfort as we remember that all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, all of our failures have been forgiven. In Christ. We believe, but we don't believe like we ought. However, Jesus will confirm, confirm us to the end. 
And this is what Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. He says there, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's Apollo. Let that resound in your hearts and in your ears this day. God is faithful. And what he has promised, he will do. God is mightily at work in the hearts of his people. And it is good for us, like Paul, to have godly desire to be grown. It is good for us to be grown by the Spirit of God. To grow in spiritual maturity, to grow in knowledge, to grow in His Word, to grow in the fear of the Lord, to grow in wisdom. We can go on and on and on. That work that he has begun in you, he will complete in you in the day of Christ Jesus. You can take that to the bank. May God give us grace indeed to believe these things, to desire these things for his glory. Amen. Let us pray.